Italian heritage is going to make my loud voice carry over all of this space. Well, I want to say welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Karen Katie. I am the director of the Georgia Council for the Arts. We are thrilled to have all of you in the audience with us today and thrilled to be here with the chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts, Rocco Landisman. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about the conversation and what's going to take place and then introduce you to some of our partners for the, for the day, for the morning. We are going to engage in a community dialogue with uh, Chairman Landisman. It'll be facilitated by our Carlton Turner of Alternate Routes and we'll bring them up in just a minute. I want to ask that you please turn your cell phones off right now, not just on silent, but we are live streaming this event. And so there is a potential that your cell phones can interfere. So please do turn them off. Following a brief conversation between Carlton and uh, Chairman Landisman, we will open the session to questions. I ask that you please keep your questions and your comments brief. There are a large number of you in this room and we want to cre create the opportunity for as many people as possible to have their questions uh, answered and uh, kind of engage in the conversation. So if you would, please join me right now in welcoming Alan Vella to the stage. He is the general manager of the Fox. They are our venue partner for this event and we are thrilled to be in this beautiful space and I'll be bringing him up. Uh, we're thrilled to be hosting this, and thank you all for coming. It's good to see all of our friends in the arts here in Georgia and Atlanta. So on behalf of the Fox Theater and the Fox Theater Institute and all of our partner Fox Theater Institute facilities around the state, we really appreciate you coming today. And we're looking forward to a very, a very exciting and dynamic conversation. So without further ado, I'll turn it back over. Thank you. So I was in Macon yesterday where, uh, where Chairman Landisman gave the keynote address at the Georgia Arts Network Conference and a reporter asked me what was the significance of having him in Georgia and uh, on this trip and in, in Macon and in Atlanta today. And I said to him, well, we here in Georgia have long known about the incredible artistic and cultural heritage of our state and the incredible arts community that keeps our economy vibrant, that helps define our communities, give them a sense of identity, give us all a collective sense of place. And having the chairman here helps us to shine the national spotlight on that and let us tell our story to the rest of the country. So in that vein, I am so grateful to have each of you in the room today to again continue that conversation um, and bring it to the national level. I'm gonna have to use my cheat sheets now. The conversation today will be facilitated, as I mentioned, by Carlton Turner. Carlton is the executive director of Alternate Groups and has been a member since 2001. He served in the organization's board as both a regional representative and as an officer. Alternate Groups hired Carlton in 2004 as a regional development director. And he held this position for four and a half years before transitioning to the role of executive director. His experience within the arts community is extensive, locally, nationally, and abroad. He has been a panelist and facilitator with the Center for Civic Participation, Arts and Democracy Project, an arts educator with the My Mississippi I program for student empowerment, and has served in the executive board of the Network of Ensemble Theaters, where he's a dedicated member of numerous organizations that bring awareness to various issues, including the arts. In 2009, Carlton visited the White House twice to meet with members of President Obama's administration on issues of cultural policy. Today, he uses these extensive skills and his experience to facilitate this community conversation. He will be joined today by Chairman Rocco Landisman. Rocco Landisman was confirmed by the United States Senate on August 7, 2009, as the 10th Chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. He pursued his undergraduate education at Colby College at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and earned a doctorate in dramatic literature at the Yale School of Drama. His ensuing career has been a hybrid of commercial and artistic enterprises, including a private investment fund, which he ran until his appointment in 1987 as president of Jujamson, a company that owns and operates five prominent Broadway theaters. 
Before and after joining Jude Damson, Mr. Landisman produced Broadway shows including Tony Award winning productions of Big River, Angels in America, the produce, and The Producers. In 2005, he purchased Jude Damson and operated it until President Obama announced his intention to nominate him to the NEA chairmanship. Mr. Landisman has been active on numerous boards and has vigorously engaged the ongoing debate about arts policy, particularly the relationship between the commercial and nonprofit sectors of the American theater. He joins us today as the foremost arts administrator in the country and to engage in a community dialogue while offering his insights and perspective on the arts. Please join me in a warm welcome for Carlton and Rockwell. Microphone too? Yeah. Great. So I got this and this and this. All right. All right. This should be all set. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, first of all, it's just great. You know, I'm a theater producer. It's great to see good box office. I'm glad so many people are, uh, are here. Um, that that's a great way to start. And uh, Alan, I don't know where, where he is, but um, this is an amazing room. Um, this is an incredibly beautiful space, and it's a. Uh, I'd come here to do any activity. It's fantastic. Um, well, I, uh, I'm going to speak hopefully, uh, hopefully briefly, and um, and uh, Carlton will, and then we'll get into a, a back and forth, which is always for me the most, uh, the most uh, engaging and stimulating and fun thing for uh, for me to do. But our agenda at the uh, at the NAA the last three or so years has been um, something we call, uh, and we didn't name it, but but um, we use the term creative placemaking. And it's really about what happens when you bring art and artists into a place, into a town, and how it transforms, how it transforms that place, uh, how um, arts can create a completely different uh, ethos and vitality and vibrancy in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a city or place. I don't think there's a better example of, of, of that happening than, than, uh, than, here, than here in Atlanta. But, um, what we've been trying to do is go around the country and highlight, um, highlight you know, great examples of this, and to do what we can to to foster it uh, our, ourselves. I mean, in a sense, we've been looking at what uh, Carlton and our alternate routes and organizations like that have been doing uh, across the country, and saying, "Boy, this really works. Th th this kind of work really does revitalize communities," and we've made that we've made that our our agenda. Uh, the first thing we did uh, was we had a program called the Mayor's, Mayor's Institute of City Design. The mayors are our natural allies in this process. They really get how arts can transform places. Um, the Mayor's Institute of City Design was already at the NEA. We, uh, you know, invested in that and beefed up its, uh, its resources and started making uh, what we called MICD grants. And then we started a program at the NEA that we call Our Town. It's called Our Town because I'm a theater guy and that's a play and I get to name things. That's one of the things, <laughs> one of my few privileges given the size of our budget at the, uh, uh, at, at the NEA. Uh, but Our Town is really about the intersection of the arts with places, with real people, with the real world as I like to call it, with, pe with people's actual lives. 
and um, this, I and mean, we've had a tremendous amount of uh, uh, of success with this to to the point that uh, in the most recent budget, uh, believe it or not, the NEA is um, is marked for an increase, and the money is 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 allocated to the uh, to the Art Town uh, budget, which really doubles the size of that of that budget. I think last year we gave away. Uh, about six point six five million dollars in um, in our town our town grants the program has been enormously uh, popular we have we have so many applications for it and um, you know it, it, when I, I was in in uh, Jackson Mississippi uh, the other day and and, and visited their uh, public art garden uh, and that's a typical type of, of project places where arts or arts organization artists can intersect with um, with with the community. When you, when you deal with design and public art, you're affecting people who will never um, think of buying a ticket to a museum or to a ballet or an opera or a, or, a, or a theater. They're intersecting every day with the design um, and the aesthetics of a uh, of a city of a, uh, of a of a community. So our our um, Emphasis has really been on on uh, on this aspect of it, art as an element for for um, uh, the changing of an ethos in a place for economic development, uh, and we and you know we don't just have um, anecdotal support for this. We've done a lot of there's a lot of research, a lot of evidence that this uh, that this works. Uh, before I got to the NEA, there was a long ten year study by. Uh, Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, who looked at uh, the cities of Sil uh, Mark Stern and Susan Seifert were the researchers, looked at the cities of Baltimore and Philadelphia, uh, examined uh, neighborhoods that had art and arts presence and one that didn't. Uh, what they found is where there was an arts presence, um, you had a much greater uh, level of civic engagement. Uh, it pr provided a tremendous. Uh, impetus toward cohesion in the social fabric. People who are involved in the arts are much more likely to vote, much more likely to join other arts, other organizations uh, besides artistic ones. Uh, a power, it, it was a powerful, found to be a powerful source, for, uh, powerful um, uh, impetus for, for um, uh, child welfare. You had demonstrably lower levels of, of truancy and, and, uh, and juvenile delinquency. We were just at the Drew School, which was, you know, was a shining, incredible example. Of, of how that uh, how that works, and finally the arts as an economic driver, as a, as a poverty fighter and as a job creator, and we've highlighted all that. We had a white paper published, um, written by uh, Ann Markison of the University of Pennsylvania, about uh, the relationship between arts and economic development. Uh, there are a number of other studies about this. There's all the work of Richard Florida and, and others, and we've really uh, fastened our our boat to this. The, to this theme, and it's one that gets traction uh, in the administration, in Congress, in the uh, in the private sector. Um, if I go around uh, the government and around around town, saying that um, the uh, uh, New York City Opera is going to go on under in uh, by Thanksgiving, if they don't uh, get forty million dollars, everyone's going to say, "Well, that's a shame. That's terrible. We love the opera, but we have bigger uh, issues on our plate right now than that." On the other hand, if I'm talking about art as being part of the social and economic fabric of a place and something that can be a catalyst for real positive change in a place, uh, it's a completely different narrative and a completely different story, and we get a completely different hearing for that on, um, uh, uh, on the Hill and in the administration uh, and everywhere. And I think this is something that's happening increasingly uh, across, across the country. Karen, who has you know, uh, been in her post a very short time, has already embraced this with a, uh, with a vengeance. And I, I, I note that um, the Arts, uh, Arts Council in Georgia is now part of the Economic Development Group, which I think is a big acknowledgment of, 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 of this theme that we're, uh, that we're talking about. So this is what, what we're about in, in broad, general uh, headline terms. Um, a lot of what we can do is use our platform to highlight that and to, uh, to bring, attention, uh, bring attention to it, as, uh, as Karen said earlier. Uh, but we're here to provide um, you know, a, a spotlight and a validation for the kind of work that Carlton and, and a lot of you in this room are doing, uh, are doing every day. You, you do the real work. Um, we're here to sort of uh, acknowledge it and, and, and point to it. So with that, let me turn it over to, uh, to Carlton and, and um, take it from there. Thank you so much. I want to start by thanking Karen um, 
from the Georgia Council for the Arts for reaching out to Alternate Roots to partner in hosting this conversation. Also to the Fox Theater for making this space available. Um, definitely to the chairman for making this visit and coming through to have this conversation with us. And most especially, I want to thank uh, the, the board members and members of Alternate Roots who have been a pillar in this work for many years, especially um, my officers who are sitting here in the front row, Shane Claire, my board chair, uh, Sage Crump, the board president, and uh, Dan Brawley, our treasurer. Uh, who've come here this morning to share in this conversation. Um, I'm just going to speak really briefly uh, just to talk about the history of Alternate Roots and the work that we do. Um, Alternate Roots was founded in 1976 at the Highlander Center in Newmarket, Tennessee. And for those of you that don't know about the, the Highlander Center, the Highlander Center is a place that was founded in 1932 and it has been a pillar in the South and Appalachia and being uh, a, a, a beacon of grassroots organizing and movement building. Um, and that is the place where in 1976 a number of theater companies gathered to form this organization. Um, of those theater companies you had organizations like the Carpetback Theater in Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, the Free Southern Theater in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, the Road Company in um, Eastern Tennessee, and even Atlanta's own Academy Theater uh, was one of those organizations. And you know they got together um, to, to really bring together 300, what now is about 375 community-based artists across the country that make up this organization. This organization is artist-led and artist-run. And these artists were really interested in how to continue to explore how art can be used to look at the complex human issues and, and use these arts as a tool for social justice. In 2011, we was turned 35 years young, and as a celebration of this milestone, we went to uh, the city of Baltimore, Maryland, West Baltimore to be more specific, uh, and we organized a, a national festival. It was a five-day event that had more than 250 artists, uh, cultural workers, ed educators, and students uh, put together um, five days of, of, of conversations and performances in an outdoor festival that attracted 11,000 people. It was an event that started with an invitation from an artist in that community to explore creative solutions to the everyday struggles that they were experiencing. The process was three years in the making. There were many conversations over food <laughs> and community centers and church basements, um, crab shacks and, and street corners. Um, but this is the place where transformation actually happens. This is where art is most powerful. And this is the heart of creative placemaking. Creative placemaking is more than the creation of an arts mural or an arts park. At its core is partnership and the placement of creative minds at the center of a community effort. Not at the end as entertainment, but at the beginning as a partner in the development of ideas. This work is not always about a product but it's always about fostering change in the perception of who can be an artist and what creativity means when employed as a real-time strategy to everyday issues. It is in this process that we forge meaningful relationships, and we all know that relationships are at the heart of any community. This work is not always glamorous and often difficult. It requires a level of transparency that is often lacking in institutions. It requires us to understand power dynamics, especially when working in communities that have been historically under-resourced and therefore lack sustainable economic infrastructure. It also requires an honest and open dialogue. But when this work is done with a listening ear and an open heart, it can lead to long-lasting personal and social transformation, one person, one community at a time. This is the work that Ultimate Roots, Ultimate Roots was created to support. This is our challenge. And this is the charge for all of us, all of us that are dedicated to using the arts to unlock human potential. It is for each of us, organizations and individuals alike, to find ways to collaborate, partner, and develop deep relationships that lead to sustainable change. This is our charge. On behalf of Alternate Roots, our members, their partners, and the communities they serve, the communities of artists and organizations in and around Metro Atlanta area in the state of Georgia, we say thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts and its efforts to continue to support creative community transformation. Um, one of our own uh, little stories is really quickly as we have Kathy Denabra in the audience, and um, she's really taken this creative place making to another level. Um, this past year, being elected the mayor of Pine Lake, Georgia. Um, and she's, uh, 
and really looking at how art can be used to transform her own community. And this is the work that we do. So um, it is really important that you all are here today to engage in this conversation. Uh, and we really look forward to finding new ways to partner. And I charge each and every one of you to think about the partnerships that you're creating in the community and what is the long-lasting, sustainable change that you're trying to create. So at this point, we'll open it up to the floor for questions. All right, there are no questions. <laughs> We've accomplished everything we need to do, and there's no issues. It's great. Uh, Doctor, what is your uh, favorite example of uh, project funded by ITAP? Well, um, there, is, there's, 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 there's so many of them, but um, there's a project in um, Wilson, uh, North Carolina, that I believe is funded by both our town, which is which is um, the NEA initiative, and um, a sister initiative, which I'll get into a little as we as we go along, called Art Place, which is a a, a private sector uh, funding initiative that's 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 being funded by the major arts funding foundations in the in the country. And I can talk about that in a minute. But uh, there's a um, sculptor named Wallace Simpson. Um, he must be 80 years old now or, or something. He does these incredible, um, weird, idiosyncratic whirly gigs um, that are real works of art, expressions of his completely wacky sensibility. And he's been doing them all his career, and they pile up on his, uh, on his farm, and people in the know know that there's these incredible structures there. Well, we're, we've provided the grant for a park to be created in um, downtown Wilson, small town, probably 4,000 people or something. Um, they're going to create a park uh, to exhibit these uh, crazy whirly gigs, and it's going to be a tourist attraction. Most certainly people are going to be excited about it and be, be coming to see it, and it's going to be an economic driver. It's going to be part of the economic revitalization of, Wils uh, of, of Wilson, North Carolina. That's a typical kind of thing. Uh, it's public art. Uh, it's accessible to the population uh, at large, and it's really at the intersection of, of, of art and and, and, and the community. So that's, that's one, of, one of my favorites. Although, although I have a long list, different times I'll mention different ones, but that's, that I think is, is, is pretty, pretty typical. Do I have an hour and a half? <laughs> um, you just hit one of the buttons. And we, we, were, we were just this morning at the Drew, it's the Drew uh, Charter School, which is amazing. I mean, if you see what, what, the, what they've done uh, in a you know, lower social economic uh, uh, area, uh, what they've done with these kids and what's ha what the, how these kids are performing on other subjects. You know, it's, it's all, the arts are a huge part of it. I would call it, it's not an art school, but it's arts-infused education. And we're seeing, I think, uh, and we've, we're just talking about that this, this morning, we're talking about it on the drive over here. I think we're seeing the beginnings of a real national movement about using the arts uh, as part of the whole education process. We, we just published a, um, um, a white paper by a, a researcher named James Catterall at, at UCLA where he took a lot of data from the Department of Labor, Department of Education, uh, and drew some amazing conclusions. H hard actually to believe if I didn't see it in black and white, which is that kids uh, from low socioeconomic backgrounds who are exposed to the arts perform on a level or above of all kids of all socioeconomic uh, backgrounds, which is an amazing thing. That never happens. But when, when the arts are part of their education, they come way up on test performance, where they go to college, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, amount of time they, they stay in school, uh, performance in, 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 other, in other subjects, math, science, et cetera. Um, and this is a very, very dramatic and striking um, body of research that's getting bigger all the time. And there are, um, what's happening at Drew is starting to happen now in different states across the country. It started in North Carolina 
with something, uh, to my knowledge, something called the A plus schools, where they do professional development of teachers in the arts. And it's not so much that they teach the arts, it's, they, it, it's what I would refer to as kind of arts infused education, where art, artistic techniques are, are used. Uh, to tremendous success. And that uh, was started to be used in, uh, in Oklahoma. And now A plus schools are all through the state of Oklahoma. And now it's coming into Arkansas, now into Louisiana. Mississippi has the whole schools uh, program. Uh, there are a bunch of Drew type um, uh, initiatives around the country. We don't have the size of budget, even the Department of Education doesn't have a sufficient budget to just you know, wave a wand and make this happen everywhere. But we're trying to use our platform and our bully pulpit to try to make people aware of how when you have uh, arts in schools, the performance of these schools goes up dramatically. And of course, it's always the first thing, uh, first thing dropped out of the curriculum when there's a budget crisis. It, it should be the last. Um, Karen and I were having conversations just this morning uh, about are there ways to to have the you know the the example of Drew be carried across uh, across the state and we need to have it um, engaged nationally. It's a, there's no more important uh, work than uh, than this. I know it's a long answer, but it's an uh, it's an important question. The whole educational system in this country cannot be to train teachers to train students to perform on standardized tests in two subjects. Um, A, sy a system that I've started to refer to as no tests left behind. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a lot more to these kids' futures than, than performing in those standardized tests and those subjects. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to, to make that happen. Um, in terms of talking about partnerships uh, and the creative placemaking, which the strategy is about bringing together various sectors to work on an issue, um, what is the strategy of the NEA in terms of building partnerships um, not just the public sector, but also in the federal government across uh, other organizational um, parts of the government. This has been a signature part of our of our work. Um, the um, the administration, uh, department, of, the office of management and budget never likes it when I refer, uh, at least publicly, to our budget as pathetic. But um, so I didn't say that. But it's but it's <laughs> thank you, Carl. But it's certainly limited, and um, there's so much more money in the other federal agencies. Yes. And uh, what we've tried to do is marshal those, those, uh, those resources. And so I've made a point of developing close relationships with the cabinet secretaries uh, in the other federal agencies so that now um, when HUD uh, brings out a $100 million NOFA notice of funding availability for its Choice Neighborhoods initiative, that money is now accessible and to arts organizations, and arts organizations are encouraged to apply for that. And we sit at the table with HUD, and and you know and and and, and help evaluate those those proposals. So we're working together with uh, with HUD and its resources. Um, you know their budget is forty billion dollars. Uh, same thing with the Department of Transportation, the Department of Education, uh, Department of Education's Promise Neighborhoods Program, another Promise uh, uh, yeah Promise Neighborhoods Program, another. Um, uh, another hundred million dollars now has a, a metric uh, for for the arts. So if there's an arts aspect to your application, you get you get bonus points uh, for this. You get you, know, you get a preference, and that's uh, having a tremendous impact on the applications that are getting written and on on what's happening in the schools that are applying for these uh, for these grants. We did a joint white paper with um, uh, Kathleen Sebelius and, the, and HHS. Uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Kathleen came over to the NEA. We kicked off a um, uh, essentially a, a working group, a study group, and we produced a white paper that lays out a research agenda for our agencies to work mutually together. Because, duh, if you look at the whole range of of, uh, of human development, arts has a huge role to play. For example, the role of music in very early cognition. There's a lot of evidence. Uh, uh, anthropological evidence that, peop that, that mothers were using music and song uh, to, to relate to their children before there was uh, spoken speech, before there was language. Um, the relationship of arts and, and um, a mental health, uh, substance abuse, uh, geriatrics. The arts have a role all across human development. So we have a joint uh, program to find out ways that we can work together with, with, with HHS because the arts intersect in their portfolio all the time. 
So it's tremendously important that we engage the other federal agencies, and I think uh, we need to do that on a, on a state level. And, and Karen and I were talking about this uh, this morning too. Got to knock on the doors of the State Department of Transportation and all the rest of it to say how can we uh, how can we work together because the arts are a natural part of each one of these agencies, and I think that's very important. Thank you. Question here. Good morning. Sure. This one. This tremendous part of the identity of a, uh, of a people. I, I think you're dealing with that every day in, in, in your work, Halton. Um, and art is the way the, the uh, culture is, is, uh, is, is, is passed on. Uh, when I visited the uh, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, uh, I was really struck by how much of the identity of those people from generation to generation is preserved by the art that is passed on and the art that is also produced Six, by successive generations. Um, in Haiti, when, they, when, when the earthquake occurred, uh, what happened? People congregated and sang. They did, uh, they did songs. They found a way to access uh, their own uh, historical, historical culture. And I think art has a tremendous uh, potential worldwide to inspire, to bring uh, together uh, generations, to pass on the essential elements of, 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 of a culture. And we have to um, we have to make that point uh, again and again, however forcefully we can. Art also has a role globally in terms of our own uh, our own place in the United States in terms of our global competitiveness. If you're talking about our economic role in the world, um, you're no longer talking really about our manufacturing imprint so much as all of uh, the other aspects of our of our culture, our creativity, imagination elements that we think of as associated with aesthetics and with, with art and with design. Um, you see that with a company like Apple uh, or with, a, or the, or the, or with you know, uh, our cultural exports, movies and, and, and the like that are, that are being done. Increasingly, our role worldwide is going to have an aesthetic uh, and creative and imaginative uh, component. Uh, it's interesting uh, that you mentioned Apple because as I'm sure you know, there was news in the last couple of weeks about Apple dodging taxes that could be providing a lot of money to our government that in some way could maybe help to make art and the arts, you know, viable. Um, the arts are not economically viable, but our country has to get into the mindset that we need the corporate success to help fuel the arts, you know, not distance themselves from it. So. That one I'm going to leave to my friends at the IRS. Um, <laughs> I have, I have an 11, uh, 11 foot pole rule at the NEA. For things you wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole, you certainly shouldn't touch with an 11 foot pole. <laughs> I want to continue the uh, comment that you made before, which was about your partnering with different organizations within the government and the town. Oh, very ample research indicates that the artistic mindsets, if we take the performer and the performance out of the conversation for a moment, it is what the actor or the performer brings to the artistic performance that is very highly correlated with creativity um, and expression. And creativity is highly correlated with entrepreneurship and success in all fields. So can you speak a little bit about what the NEA is doing in terms of direct partnerships with for-profit corporations around the country uh, in terms of that relationship? Well, very little in terms of direct relationship with, with for-profit companies. I mean, we really are here uh, 
in a way, in some ways, to make sure that the, um, because we're a grant making organization, to make sure that it's not just the marketplace that uh, determines what art gets produced. One of the reasons you have an NEA is to subsidize forms of art and, and, and works of art that aren't going to be uh, supported by, readily supported by the marketplace per se. That being said, as we look at the uh, ecology of a, of, a, uh, uh, of a city or town, the economic ecology of it, uh, it's apparent that, that uh, you know, there's, no, there's not a terribly important distinction between the for-profit and non, not-for-profit arts as those help to revitalize a, uh, a community. Uh, what's the difference really in, in, um, in Miami between um, all of the um, museums uh, and not-for-profit art or arts organizations and, and art, ba you know, art Basel and the, uh, uh, and the gallery scene. It's all part of one, one, uh, one continuum and I think it's our job to highlight that and, and, and it, it, you know, it's sometimes hard to make distinctions. But um, we do try to subsidize work that might not otherwise be, um, uh, be provided for in the, in the marketplace. We know that in Europe, um, well over 80% of arts nonprofits. We know that in Europe, well over 80%, perhaps even 90% in some countries of the arts nonprofit arts are supported and funded by the government, which is which, which is very foreign to a far away operating in America. However, there has been a movement in the last decade among um, musicians like Quincy Jones to help establish some more visibility and support. Um, through a cabinet position, um, as instead of an NEA, it's elevated to a uh, cabinet position of Ministry of Arts and Culture. What is your viewpoint now on that? Would it be to the advantage of the country of, in terms of our development? Would it not be necessary? And what is the status of that? My, my view is that that would probably be a positive thing. I don't think it's going to happen in this uh, budgetary climate anytime soon. I don't. I think probably the last thing that Congress is going to do is to create uh, another um, cabinet ministry of any kind, uh, let alone the uh, let alone the arts. I just don't think that's the um, mood in the country uh, at, at the moment. But you know, uh, do I wish that that uh, you know there, there there was a that we had a chance to uh, talk about cultural national cultural policy the way other countries can, yes, I think that would be, that would be a nice thing. I, don't, I, don't, I just don't think it's going to happen so uh, anytime soon. So there, there is, continues to be a lack of understanding about economic growth, about economic growth and the arts, and, and just the growth of the country, how important, for example, software development teams, and, and how closely that is related to all the things that develop the arts. This, that, story, that story is beginning to be told. It's beginning to get traction. The mayors get it totally. We're increasingly seeing it in states. Um, I think we're seeing it with Governor Deal here in, here, here, in, here in Georgia. There's a recognition of the real economic power that the, uh, that the arts have. Um, I think that story is, is unfolding, uh, but it's, it's, it's a process and it's going to take, take some time. But I think, I, think it is, I think it is happening. And I think uh, even the levels of Congress, there's recognition of it. Uh, congressmen have, have arts activity in their districts and they can see the impact of it. We've There's a question over here. Over here. We've seen in other communities where um, creative place making, bringing an artist into a community that may have been on the downswing economically has led to an upturn, uh, but it's also led to gentrification uh, and people who live in that community not being able to stay there. Um, what, what are some of the how this challenge is being addressed by some of the, the NEA out, our town grants or some of the, the work that's being done with the white papers and some of the studies? Gentrification is, a, is an interesting issue. Uh, some of it is, is, is not such a bad thing. I, I remember when um, I was in Baltimore with, with uh, Sean Donovan, the, the uh, secretary of HUD, and uh, HUD was financing an artist housing project in, I'm telling you, a tough, tough neighborhood uh, in Baltimore. Nothing there. I'm just, you know, looked like something bombed out and cratered and, 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 you know, tough, tough district. And they're creating some artist housing because artists, you know, love to go into places that, where, where you can, you know, buy a house for uh, $8,000 or, or, or move into some, you know, subsidized apartments and, and start doing your work. And I said, I said to the uh, mayor of Baltimore, 
I said, well, so this starts to take hold and starts to happen. What about gentrification? And she said, please God. <laughs> um, you know, to have some, some tax base, to have some increase in economic development, um, I think is a positive thing. You know, what happens when, you, when it becomes Soho and artists are priced out of the, uh, uh, the area, that's another issue. And there, there are ways to approach this. One, one is, I think, um, if artists are helping to revitalize a, a neighborhood or community, maybe there's a way to give them some equity in what, in what they're achieving, some, rather than subsidized rental, uh, some, some equity in their, um, in their residences. So they have an investment to, to stay there and are, in effect, subsidized to uh, continue to, uh, uh, to be there. So, so you don't have a continual cycle where, where artists come into a um, community, revitalize it, and then get priced out because they can't afford to, uh, to live there anymore. They're, they're dealing with this in New York City with, with, you know, with strategies to, uh, to help the artists participate in what they, uh, what, they, what they create. But that's an important challenge. Absolutely. And I think uh, another, another part of that is, is looking at the artists that already live in that community and how can they begin to have a stake in, in a community that is, that is being shown some interest from you know, people who have uh, some of the, the more investment capabilities to help to bring about some of the change in those communities. Uh, we saw some similar things in Baltimore when we were working there that uh, when people would talk about the creative place making, it, it often seemed like they were talking about bringing artists from somewhere else into that community uh, and ignoring the fact that culture exists in every community and how can we use these opportunities to elevate the culture that existed naturally and create space for those community members uh, to, to have a platform to, to elevate their own voice. So I appreciate you know, the work that's being done. Um. That's exactly what I was going to ask you about, actually. Um, in creative place making and so forth, uh, looking at individual artists, NEA doesn't give any money to individual artists anymore. I don't believe I was wondering if there was any hope for that. Um, then my second question is, Alternate Bridge was born out of a little bit of initiative from the federal government. I wonder if there are any scary organizations that go look at that might be trying to block things like positive social change that the NBA is interested in lifting up and supporting, or do you find any kind of subversive ideas than that? <laughs> We're back to the 11 foot pole. Um, I won't speak to the merits of any particular organizations. That comes through a panel process, and, Car and Carlton's been on those panels and, and certainly knows how that, uh, how that works. With regard to individual artists, um, you know, I would like to see individual artists supported, of course. We're the, we're the National Endowment for the Arts. We should be supporting artists you know, directly. Uh, right now, that's not what's mandated by, uh, by Congress. Uh, it hasn't been on the top of my uh, agenda because there's so many things we have to do in such a short time. Um, if we're up to me personally, uh, we would have direct support uh, for, for artists, um, and we do in some areas. Uh, in literature, um, we give uh, direct grants, to, uh, literature grants. Uh, we do it with our heritage uh, fellowships, with our uh, Jazz Masters um, awards. Uh, we do a fair amount of it, but, but um, you know, we're, we're, we're um, limited by Congress in terms of what we can do, actually. There's a guy back there who's had his hand up all day, and I want to... I was listening to you talk about how you tried operating in DC, and I was wondering what you would like to see arts organizations do kind of at that same kind of lateral uh, uh, level. But the micro example, our organization, you generously funded the Atlanta Shakespeare Company to work with uh, two of the Atlanta public high schools to, uh, to do residence with what our Shakespeare plays. Fantastic experience, has all the years that you talked about, which is uh, and, and we leverage your uh, funding with uh, a private foundation locals so we do that and we, we obviously work with land public school, but can one leverage it more? Can we, you know, can we extend and what would your thoughts be on to the ways that the individual organizations here could be thinking more broadly about them? I think the two obvious ways are other sources of, 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 uh, of public funding through other, other city, state, City and state agencies, as we're doing on the on the national level with our agencies, and in the in the um, in, in the in the private sector. I mean, we we started Art Place as a way to uh, you know gain resources and, and scale up resources uh, for for um, for investment in the arts. And Art Art Place is um, is growing rapidly. We're adding more foundations all the time. Uh, individuals. Uh, we now have a uh, 
a loan fund that's being sponsored by uh, investment by six banks. And I think the, um, uh, the you know, the, the, the private sector is a, uh, the organized private sector, particularly foundations, uh, are a way to, um, a way to go for that. Morning. Hi. Um, you mentioned partnerships with the, the different departments and mentioned education specifically. I wonder, I teach um, arts in the prisons and consider arts and education to be the best way to reduce uh, recidivism and consider that to be the most marginalized population, one of the most marginalized populations in America. How do you uh, worked at all or talked at all with the Department of Justice to try to increase um, funding for arts uh, and uh, within the prison uh, across the country? We haven't, and I think it's a good idea. And there, there's, there's some departments, uh, and the Department of Justice is one that we haven't reached yet. I mean, we, we, we are you know, on this full throttle with the ones we've engaged. Uh, but the, I think the Department of Justice, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, all of those are, are still on the table. And I think they're natural, uh, you know, what, what you just described uh, with the prison population would be a natural for the arts, and we should, uh, we should be talking about that, absolutely. A recent report from the National Council for Responsive Philanthropy, which identified the disproportionate amount of philanthropic resources in the arts going to a small minority of organizations to the detriment of artist led organizations, organizations from uh, culturally specific communities, and organizations working for social justice and social change. Has that report had an impact? on the thinking at the NEA about your distribution of resources? That, that probably is a better question for the, for the people who actually, you know, decide on those grants. They're decided by specific panels, by, by Joan Shigagawa, who's, 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 my, who's my, uh, my deputy there. I, I don't think um, it's the purpose of, of, of an arts grant-making organization to be out promoting any, uh, any particular social agenda per se, any kind of, any kind of uh, social justice in and of itself. I think we're, you know, the excellence of the art, the quality of the art plays a huge role in how we make, uh, make our grants, uh, and it should. That said, uh, I think there's been a tendency at um, uh, the funders across the board, both in the private sector and at the NEA and the public sector, to fund what we already know. And the, you know, have the relationships we already have, the people we've already funded, the organizations we know well, we know their work, and the easy thing is to keep funding them. We're trying to open up that process. Uh, we just came under a lot of criticism uh, because our funding for um, PBS and PBS stations uh, was cut back in this last cycle. Well, the reason that was cut back is because we opened up the category. It used to be uh, a funding stream for radio and television, now we've opened that up agnostically to a much wider media. There's so much work that's now produced on the internet, on YouTube, uh, you know, independent films, um, something that's not just done by um, WNET in New York or by, or by PBS. So we now have vastly more, a vastly bigger application pool to choose from, and we're trying to get out and around into other organizations rather than just the, uh, uh, the tried and true ones. Uh, uh, that we that we that we know already and have historically always funded. Back to education. Um, I'm a teacher. I'm a fourth and fifth grade classroom. And um, in my previous career, I developed software and school databases. Right now, I'm working on projects um, specifically in STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, but uh, incorporating technology, math, uh, science, and the arts, uh, specifically dance and drama. And I'm interested from your perspective. Um, I'm, all, I'm disappointed, or maybe I just haven't found it yet. To, I expect to see online um, more of a webcast or PBS video or something where these type of collaborations are being done. Given the, given the understanding that STEM is a priority for this country, um, I mean, I'm happy to work with you at my school, but I'm, I'm surprised and disappointed that more. From your perspective, where is this work being done? Um, who's doing it? Well, it was interesting when we were when we were just at Drew. We, we saw the intersection of art and science all the time. There was there was a um, 
uh, they're using magnets to, to, uh, to, 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 to create, uh, use of magnets to create painting. So you learn about science and painting at the same time. Uh, we're having a lot of discussions now with the National Science Foundation uh, and with our counterparts, uh, science counterparts in the federal government to find out ways that we can uh, start, to, uh, start to work together. I think it's an important new agenda and we're going you know, to be on it more and more. Thank you all so very much. That's fun. This is the part I like the most is when there's a real back and forth. So I think. Hope I